Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephen McCaskill, and I'm looking forward to teaching you a little bit about the history of money. The English language is a beautiful example of a spontaneous order. It is a protocol that has emerged through evolution so that we can communicate with each other on a more personal level. And within the English language, you'll find cliches or phrases that we frequently use. And there's a word that is used in many different cliches, and that is gold, as good as gold, a gold standard, a golden age, a heart of gold, a gold digger. <laughs> and the reason why is that we have agreed upon gold as a symbolic representat representation to mean something of great value. So I'd like to predict, although you can't really predict this, these types of things in a spontaneous order, but I'd be willing to put some money on it, then in the next hundred years we'll be using a new word or a new cliche, and that word is crypto. Not only will it mean things of great value, but it will also mean things of awesomeness or amazingness. This conference is crypto. <laughs> and the reason why is that digital, digital cryptographically secured tokens on a trustless network will become universally recognized as money within the next 50 years, if not sooner. Cryptocurrencies, as they are called, will end the monopoly that central banks and legal tender legislation have on money. This will give us greater choice and an expansion of, out of resources and allocation of capital that we haven't seen in over 100 years. 150 years ago, there was a gold rush on the South Island. This Otago gold rush brought 20,000 miners from California and Australia. And the first ones who got there were led by Maori guides to Shotover River, where they found thousands of kilograms of gold washed up on the shores of the river. Within a matter of hours, the first ones who got there managed to pull up a million dollars worth of gold, just picking it off the shores. It's very reminiscent of the crypto rush that's happening today. So when these prospectors asked the Maori, guides, why didn't they pick up the gold or find value in it or use it? And the Polynesians said, well, they used greenstone or, or jade as money, among other things, and they didn't have any use for the gold, and so they saw no value in it. And that teaches us an important lesson. The value is, is really subjective. It's in the eye of the beholder. It also shows us that money like language and like markets, are a spontaneous order. It's something that evolves so that it meets our needs. The medium that we use for money doesn't necessarily matter as long as it's stable and something that we can all agree upon and have low friction to exchange value. So if you look back further in time, you'll see that since 600 BC, gold and silver have been used as uh, coinage. Since then, we've used many other things as money, but around the world, we always re reverted back to precious metals at some point in history. And the reason why, I think, are the physical properties that are given to metal. They are specifically to gold and silver. They don't corrode. They're scarce, which means they have lots of value. They're the best conductors of electricity. But most importantly, they're shiny, and we love shiny objects. So when people say that precious metals have intrinsic value, what they really mean is that it has utility or use cases outside of money uh, in jewelry and industry, ele um, electronics, dentistry. And so these use cases are what gives gold and silver the ability to be a commodity and the ability to be used as money. So, if you, uh, if you uh, look throughout history, you see that um, money, or most people know about gold 
as money. But for most of history, we actually had silver as the primary form of money. Uh, the dollar, which is used in over 25 different countries, goes back to the finest silver coin made in Europe, named the Taller. The British pound, or the British currency, was named after a weighted pound of sterling silver. And this started to change when we started to transition from a silver standard, or silver um, as money, to gold, when we started meddling with the market. So rather than letting supply and demand determine the price between gold and silver, we decided that we thought we knew better. In fact, it was Isaac Newton, head of the Royal Mint, who set a fixed price between gold and silver. Unfortunately, he didn't have enough knowledge to know what the supply and demand equilibrium should be. So he ended up overpricing gold and undervaluing silver. And so while other European nations brought gold over to Europe, they exchanged their overvalued gold for British undervalued silver. What happened was uh, the, all the silver reserves that England sat on disappeared, and they were forced to move over to a gold standard. Now, during this time, there was uh, an interesting innovation that happened in the Americas. In the late 1600s, the Massachusetts government would send their soldiers to what is now known as Canada on expeditions. They were, in reality, pirate raids. They would uh, go and they'd pillage and steal and loot, and they'd bring back bounty of fur and treasure to Boston to be sold on the market so that the Massachusetts government could um, pay the soldiers every year and continue that process. Unfortunately, in, in 1690, the soldiers brought back less than anticipated bounty so that the Massachusetts government was unable to pay their pirates. And so they thought that they had came, come up with an ingenious idea, and that was the creation of paper money. This was the first instance in the Western world that we have of paper money. Before that, warehouses would use uh, gold receipts or, or paper receipts that represented gold, but this was the first time that a government had issued paper money in, in the Western world. Now, they printed 7,000 pounds of paper money on two promises. And the first, was that it would be able to be redeemed for metal in the next two years. And the second was that they would never print it ever again. <laughs> as you can guess, as these things go, both promises were broken. And rather than paying in metal in a, a couple of years, the Massachusetts government thought, wow, this is such a great idea. What we're going to do is print 40,000 pounds more paper. And so, overnight, the value of the currency dropped by 40%. In fact, the prices of all goods rose by 40% and continued to rise over the next few months. So it teaches us an important lesson that money creation is not wealth creation. So over the uh, next uh, several hundred years, there was an industrial revolution. And while the world was transitioning from a, a silver to a bimetallic to gold standard, s some unique innovations were happening in Northern America. While everyone agreed upon gold and silver as an, a, an amazing analog form of money, there was innovation that happened on the fringes where banks could compete and each bank could issue their own currency. The ones that were dishonest and they printed and printed and printed were the ones who harmed their community and quickly went out of business when there was a run in their bank. And the ones that succeeded were the ones that were able to serve their local community and allocate capital in the most efficient way. So we saw booms and busts during this time, but the ones that were 
recessions were very localized to that community, and that community bounced back very quickly. This started to change first in Europe in the 17 and 1800s when the European nations granted one bank the sole right to issue money in that realm. This happened in the United States as well in 1913 with the creation of the Federal Reserve, preventing any bank in, in the United States to, from printing their own money. This stopped innovation, and it led to the rise of what's now known as inflation. Now, we're often taught in school that inflation is an increase in prices. But the reality is inflation, or an increase in prices, is a consequence of inflation. An increase in prices happens when there's an increase in the money supply. Now, before we had paper money, uh, or centrally controlled paper money, there was a, we lived in a world of deflation uh, with a fixed supply of gold, which included all the gold mined since the beginning of time. It grew very slowly. And so with the growth of population and creation of goods and services, uh, the, you, the value of your gold was worth more every year. And so if you think about the incentives that give someone, it, you start seeing what inflation can do. So if, if you have the, uh, um, an incentive where your, your income is worth more the following year than it is right now, you have an incentive to save and invest. Whereas under a system of inflation where your money is worth less the following year, you have an incentive to spend. And when you add cheap credit, then you have an incentive to spend money you don't even have. And so rather than having a, an environment where people are encouraged to save and invest, you have an environment where people are encouraged to consume and waste. The, uh, the, the creation of a central bank over money, although it's a benevolent institution that tries to improve the economy, its, its goal is to stabilize prices and stabilize the economy. But unfortunately, this centralized system is unable to collect enough data, enough knowledge, to be able to ha know exactly what the supply and demand can do or what the supply and demand should be of money. And so while they guess, what monetary policy is, is an increase or decrease of the money supply. It's not the control of interest rates. So they target an interest rate, and they guess what the market interest rate should be. But the, the interest rate will either be above or below what the market says. So, this creates a system of malinvestment or misallocation of resources. If the central bank sets an interest rate that's lower than what the market rate should be, it signals to an entrepreneurs and to individuals that it's time to borrow, to invest in a project or invest in a house. But the reality is the interest rate that's been signaled to them is much lower than what the actual market rate should be. So the company or the individual is unable to get the ROI that they initially thought. And so when they invest in capital or a project, they're unable to uh, get the money, the ROI back, and so they're unable to repay the bank. And this creates an enormous amount of misallocation of resources. It creates what's now known as the boom and bust cycle that we've had quite frequently over the last 100 years. In addition to that, we've now given fiscal policy and monetary policy to one institution, and that is the government. And they are very contradictory of each other. See, fiscal policy is a balancing of budget, where you take in your income and uh, spend where you can, 
But now they have the ability to create more money to spend on projects that they hadn't been able to do before. And they create that money through debt creation. That is how uh, your currency is made. So now we have digital currency. And what uh, it solved was the issue of dig digital scarcity. So we are now able to transition from analog money to digital money. And this transition is going to take quite some time. But we're seeing that this technology it has many different use cases outside of money. It is decentralizing systems in a wide variety of industries. So this, uh, these use cases are what, um, are, are what is commoditizing the technology. And as the technology becomes commoditized, it will give people the ability to choose their money. So now consumers have a choice of what kind of money they want to use. They can choose a money that's open source, auditable, bound by the laws of maths, or they can choose a money that is controlled by people that devalues every year. And I think over the long run, it will be a no-brainer. But with this, uh, with this ability to have this choice of being able to choose a stable form of money, we are going to see an enormous amount of resources that are going to be uh, allocated much more efficiently than what they are under the current system, which is going to lead to an exponential growth of human prosperity. So before the word gets cliched and watered down and used in, in everyday language, uh, I, I like to use it in its infinite glory. And what Satoshi Nakamoto did was spark the largest nonviolent revolution the world has ever seen, and that is crypto. Thank you. And if you have, um, uh, my talk was loosely based on this essay by uh, F.A. Hayek, who was a, a very well-known uh, intellectual of the last uh, century. And um, he laid a lot of the theoretical foundations behind blockchain technology. And yeah, if anyone's interested in buying Bitcoin, uh, Dasset is coming soon.